Okay. Uh, thanks everyone. It's 3.10, so let's get started. Uh, welcome to our second speaker of the Compass Lecture Series of the Fall 2022 semester. Um, today, we are welcoming Tanya Kovacevic from Earth and Planetary Science. Uh, Tanya is a PhD candidate in Earth and Planetary Science Department at UC Berkeley. She attended Las Positas Community College in Livermore before transferring to University of Colorado, Denver, where she received her bachelor's degree in chemistry. Nowadays at Berkeley, she uses first principle computer simulations to understand the interior and evolution of exoplanets. Today, she will give a talk about her journey into higher education and a recent project where she calculated the conditions for mixing of rock and ice at extreme conditions pertinent to the rock ice boundary within massive water world interiors. Uh, without further ado, let's, met, let's uh, welcome Tanya. Okay, so thanks, thanks for the kind introduction. Um, today, I will talk about the song of rock and ice. Seems fuzzy to me, featuring water world interiors. I try to get the mother of dragons to lay down on this track. She wouldn't have it, so water world interiors it was. Um, again, my name is Tanya Kovacevic. I'm a PhD candidate. I'm um, in the Earth and Planetary Science Department. I work in Burkhard Militzer's group um, here on campus. So to say it for the third time, uh, I'm a third year uh, PhD student in the Earth and Planetary Science Department. Uh, a little bit of background on me is I'm a refugee and a first generation college student. I came to America in 1998. So I pretty much grew up here, but um, yeah, and I was the first one to attend community college in my family. So before I begin the sciencey part of my talk, I wanted to take you guys through kind of like my path to what I do here in like graduate school. So um, I began my path to higher education at Las Positas Community College. So just over the hills in Livermore, um, where I got, uh, after three years, I got an associates in math and science. And then I moved my way over to CU Denver where I decided to major in chemistry. And then between my junior and senior year, so like that last year at Denver, I did a summer research uh, internship at MIT where I was in the nuclear science and engineering department. And this is the first time. So I learned, the first time I learned about what a PhD was, was in community college. And it was it wasn't until I was like almost in my last year of college that I learned I could get a PhD in planetary science. So that just kind of like an anecdote that it's never too late to figure things out. Um, so I spent eight weeks at MIT, went back over to Denver for my last year of college. Um, I applied to a bunch of grad schools with a hop and a skip. I ended up here at uh, the Earth and Planetary Science Department at Berkeley. And now I'd like to explain to you guys kind of uh, what I do here at Berkeley and um, what I'm interested in. So a little personal story I'd like to share with everyone was um, this is a paper that really put my research into perspective and context for me. So as a chemist by training, um, one of the first papers I ever presented to uh, Burkhardt's group was this paper here. Um, I'm not going to read the title, it's a little long, um, but it's pretty much just explains through a chemist's point of view how the um, behavior of atomic properties changes with increasing pressures and temperatures. Um, so the authors ended up reinterpreting the periodic table um, with these updated properties. And it was like so cool to me because when I was in college and undergrad, when I was doing my homework and doing lab work, we always perform things at STP, which means standard temperatures and pressures, which is pretty much what we experience here on the surface of the planet. Um, and I realized that most of the matter within solar systems and within just planetary systems around us are like subject to super extreme pressures and temperatures. And it just like, it made me realize like, wow, so we really need to learn how matter acts at extreme conditions. And it just really excited me. And it then even like kind of made me feel like, oh, I came to the right place because I want to study planet interiors and study these extreme conditions. And like, here I am doing it and I get to present this super cool paper, which like I could understand because it was in chemistry terms. Um, so yeah, it was just a really cool way to begin my uh, PhD journey. So I'm interested in planetary interiors and I work in theoretical high energy density physics. You're gonna see an acronym in a second, but um, I just wanna state that that's what we do. And um, that means that I use computers 
uh, to calculate material properties. And I'm interested in planet um, interiors. So the densities here and the temperatures are going to be uh, pretty extreme. We consider them extreme compared to, again, the surface of Earth. Um, so here on that right hand side, I have a plot of density and temperature. And um, this shows kind of like what, like, let's just say, for example, Earth's core and Jupiter's core. Um, we have to get like super dense and the temperatures have to be like thousands of Kelvin um, high, which that's really hot. So um, we really need to understand how material behaves at these uh, conditions to understand what like the insides of our planets are made of. So uh, I want to outline how I'll be giving my talk today. I'll begin with a little bit of background to set up the motivation um, for investigating rock and ice um, mixing. Then uh, we'll discuss two methods we use to investigate this rock and ice mixing and prove that um, it could might be happening within some exoplanets uh, we are determining. And then finally, I'll end with some broader impacts. So I just want to show that this ribbon at the top is going to help us keep track of where we are in the talk. Um, things will be highlighted in green when we're at that certain part of the talk. Okay, so why look at the interior of planets? Um, this is a super cool like video graphic that someone recently presented showing some of the exoplanets we found so far. And we can visualize in this figure, the orbit of the planets, the size, the relative, okay, let me use this, the relative um, size of the planets, and then also the um, temperatures of those planets. Oh, my little pointer isn't showing up. So just that's what this figure is trying to, this video is trying to show. So um, there are over 5,000 exoplanets that we've found so far, we've been able to confirm. Um, I checked an hour ago, it was 5,090. Um, and then with such a large bank of exoplanets, and no way to just run over to these planets, grab what's on the inside of them and like experimentally sample them. Um, it's a super exciting time to be a high energy density physicist um, to figure out what's inside these planets. Um, these exoplanets can be categorized into four types of planet, 188 of them being um, categorized terrestrial, so iron and rocky rich. Um, there are super Earths, so there's 1,582 of these. They are considered um, rich in iron or hypothesized to be rich in iron, rock, and ice. Sub Neptune, so a little smaller than Neptune, are uh, 1,779 of these, uh, hypothesized to be rich in rock, ice, and gas. And then finally, we have these gas giants, which are hypothesized to be rich in ice and gases. Um, I want to put a caveat out there. This is a very very simplistic view of these planet interiors. And there are still so many mysteries that we have to determine about what's in them. So I have all these question marks because these are hypotheses. You might ask some other planetary scientists and they might have, or astrophysicists, they might have different ideas about what's on the interior of these planets. But I'm just giving like a very general kind of maybe a summary of what we might consider might be inside these planets. Also depends on how we think they formed. There's a lot of work to be done. Um, so. Ultimately, what I'm trying to get across is that we're more confident about the sizes of these planets in terms of like when we categorize them than we are about what their interiors are. Okay, and the two most common types of exoplanets range in between super Earth and sub Neptunes, uh, meaning that a little larger than Earth, a little smaller than Neptune. And there are some researchers, me being included, um, that believe that some of these super Earth and sub-Neptunes could be water rich. And some theorists have shown that some of these exoplanets um, ranging a little closer in size to super Earths um, in that scale of super Earth to sub-Neptune um, may indeed have these massive um, icy layers. So we're looking forward to more results from um, JWST. There was recently one that like just got put out that they think they found some water on like a, a planet, what was it, like 10 million light years away? So there's there's a lot um, of lot to look forward to in this uh, research field. So based on the title of my talk, I am going to focus on water worlds. Let me first begin by defining what we mean by water world. It's going to be a planet of rock and icy composition without a significant atmosphere. Um, in this figure to the left here, I made a simple and commonly used model for water rich exoplanets where we have this iron core, a rocky mantle, and then a massive water layer overlaid. So as I mentioned a little earlier, we're still pretty naive um, in our understanding of material uh, properties at extreme conditions. 
And depending on how hot the planet is and a couple of other things, um, the material may behave in ways that we're, we don't really experience here on the surface of Earth. Um, where am I? One sec. Okay, there we go. Um, so I'm interested in how rock and water interact at the bottom of these giant uh, water ice layers, where as we move into the center of the planet, pressures and temperatures are going to start increasing really fast. Um, and yeah, and then by miscible, what I mean is, do they mix? Do they fully mix at these conditions that are found um, at this boundary layer? Um, so let's investigate. To begin, I need to pick a rocky material. So let's choose Enstatite or MgSiO3. It's the most common rocky material in Earth and one that's commonly used when we're trying to interpret um, exoplanets tend to stick with MgSiO3 as a rocky material to be used within these planets. And then water ice, what else other than H2O? These are um, some of the conditions I plan to investigate. Um, so if we think about rock and ice on the surface of Earth, they don't mix, right? You can toss some water on rock. It'll, I don't know, make the rock change a different color, make it get a little darker, and then it'll evaporate over time. Um, but what happens if we explore these extreme conditions? So really quickly, we have pressure on the x-axis and temperature on the y. And I want to just um, put it into units that maybe we're more familiar with. Um, when we think about temperature, uh, we planetary scientists usually use Kelvin. Um, around 273 Kelvin is equal to 1 Celsius. So the temperatures I'm planning to investigate go a little above 7,500 Celsius. And then this term GPA is gigapascal. So 1 times 10 to the 9. So that means nine zeros behind it. So 1 times 10 to the 9 Pascal is equal to 1 gigapascal. So that's a lot of pressure. Another way we can also kind of Put ourselves into perspective is to think of what temperatures and pressures we experience at the surface of earth so um, i just put a little earth plot here of what the surface conditions are for earth the temperatures are around 290 kelvin and then uh, the pressures that we experience on the surface of earth go to the 10 to the 5 pascal so we're going really high in pressure and temperature okay now, how do we plan to investigate whether rock and ice mix? Um, well, I mentioned at the beginning of my talk that we run computer simulations. And to be more specific, um, in our group, uh, some of the simulations we do run are density, functional theory, molecular dynamics, or I'll say uh, DFT MD. Um, we use a proprietary software, VASP, to run these calculations. And DFT MD is really good because it helps us um, predict material properties with the accuracy of quantum mechanics, quantum mechanics and allows us to reach these super extreme conditions that we might not be able to reach um, in an experimental laboratory. Um, so now I'd like to take you through the steps of how we run these DFT MD simulations. And again, this overview will be like a, so an oversimplification, um, but it'll give us a little bit of a peek as to what's going on under the hood with our calculations. So we begin with step one. We have to uh, give our uh, give VASP an initial configuration of atoms. So all these atoms have some x, y, z coordinates. And then with this approximated um, uh, Schrodinger equation using this Concham scheme, scheme uh, we are able to get an electron density around the atoms. So a ground state um, electron density around the atoms. And here I've highlighted uh, the energy term in the Schrodinger equation. So when we take the derivative of energy, we can get um, forces and we have a Newton's second equation, Newton's second equation of motion, um, which is F equals MA. And that'll pretty much tell us how and where to move our atoms to the next step. So here we are, we have our electron uh, density. The forces tell us where to move the atoms. They move. And then we start with step one again. And we're going to do that over and over again until we get a whole trajectory. So again, we can perform steps one through three and do that over and over again, several tens of thousands of times um, until we obtain a molecular dynamics uh, trajectory. And I'll show you a trajectory in a couple of slides. It's kind of fun to see. Um, but from these trajectories, we're able to get a lot of thermodynamic inter, uh, information, such as pressure, temperature, volume, density, and energy. And then from these, we can derive um, a bunch of stuff. So for example, we can de derive an equation of state. So how the 
the pretty much the phase of the material in thermodynamic equilibrium. We can get material properties, so it gives us some uh, information about the structure of planets. So for example, maybe how heat moves through the planet. And then finally, we can get transport properties, uh, which gives us uh, some insight into planet evolution. I'll focus on the equation of state for uh, my work because we're just trying to see whether rock and ice mix. So what um, equilibrium stage, what phase the rock and ice will be at a certain pressure and temperature. Okay, now let's jump into using this DFTMD to investigate mixing. Um, I would like to show uh, some other work that has used DFTMD to investigate mixing, um, such as uh, iron and um, MGO or brucite. It's another rocky material. Uh, was investigated, that miscibility was investigated for terrestrial planets. And then we have um, hydrogen with rock and then hydrogen with water. The mixing of these materials was investigated um, in regards to gas giants. So just giving a little bit of um, like, we believe DFTMD is a good tool for the job. So to remind everyone, I'm interested in MGSIO3 and uh, H2O water ice. Um, for our simulations of this rock ice mixing. And then we'll be using this uh, heat until it mixes approach. So let's explain to you what that is now. First, we build our rock ice supercell. So that's kind of the step one. We need to give initial configuration of atoms. We have our MgSiO3 and we have our H2O atoms. And the atoms are all colored uh, with how the legend pretty much states here. Um, I just want to uh, clarify that I've colored the rock oxygens and the ice oxygens um, differently, even though in our simulations, they're described with the same potentials. So pretty much they're like the same types of oxygen. It's just a little easier to visualize the difference between rock and ice when I color those oxygens um, a little differently. So we'll perform a series of molecular dynamic simulations at a fixed volume. So keeping this volume fixed while increasing the temperature um, step by step and seeing if we observe mixing. We'll do this by building uh, three systems. So what were this system right here is specifically this um, system I uh, initialize at 120 GPA, um, but we'll start them at an initial pressure at zero Kelvin, and then we'll perform the, our molecular dynamic simulations again at fixed volume, increasing the temperature in 500 degree increments until we get to 8,000 Kelvin. And this should result in three isochores in pressure, temperature, space, um, and we'll have one isochore for each system. After many hundreds of hours, there are my three isochores, and um, we're able to get, uh, yeah, each of these points is a different simulation that was run for, you know how I said we have to run those steps one through three 20,000 times? That gets us one dot. So it's like lots of, lots of simulations we have to run. Um, so, we have these simulations and now we must analyze them and determine whether there is mixing happening at certain pressures and temperatures in the ones that I investigated. So we use this, we do this by using two quantitative methods. We can calculate the mean square displacement and then um, the radial distribution function for certain atomic pairs. The MSD is gonna tell us how much an atom moves throughout a trajectory. So um, if we do this just in one dimension in the Z uh, direction, um, if the um, if the atom moves a lot, that's one way we can interpret that. Like, oh, okay, maybe these are mixing since that atom is like moving a lot and maybe crossing over this uh, interface boundary. The radial distribution function, or sometimes you also, if you Google it, you might see pair correlation function. It's the probability of finding a particle at a distance r from another tagged particle. So what we did was take the magnesium and silicon ions and calculate these RDFs um, for the magnesium and silicon with the different oxygens in our system. So we have these red oxygens and blue oxygens. And I think we can all agree that if rock and ice aren't mixing, these radial distribution functions would show that um, the magnesium and the magnesium and silicon aren't getting near those water oxygens. So that's pretty much what that's going to tell us. So if they are getting near each other, that's also another really powerful way we use to um, indicate whether our systems were mixing. So after doing all that, I'm not going to show you numbers or equations or calculations. I'm just going to, you're going to have to trust me that we were able to determine where mixing happened. So um, yeah, we were able to determine where it happened. And these blue points, um, I'm trying to signify um, where rock and ice are not miscible. And then the red points are everywhere where rock and ice 
are miscible. So they do mix. And by mix, I mean, they're gonna spontaneously mix at those temperatures. Um, so now I'd like to show you what I mean by mixing. Um, we'll take a short look at a trajectory. Um, this one to be specific in our system three at 7,000 Kelvin. Um, again, this is visual. Now it's visualizing that steps one through three times 20,000. Uh, we're gonna visualize it in a video. If it will play, there we go. So we begin with kind of a rocky area and a ice area. And as this trajectory moves forward, I think we can all agree that it's kind of becoming like this rock ice slurry. There's not really any uh, rock crystals or ice crystals that we can determine. They all kind of mix together. And again, by coloring the uh, water oxygens and the rock oxygens difference, it just even more shows like how much these two materials mix. Okay, so a figure taken from the paper. Um, I'll let me just first uh, summarize that when we overlay the curves for both rock and for water, I think we can all see a trend across the three isocores that for mixing, um, once rock melts, rock and water ice become miscible. Um, so again, if you want to, I know this figure changed a little. These points now have different shapes. You can read the paper if you want to figure out, again, a little more what's going on under the hood, what we believe is going on under the hood before mixing takes place. But the main idea where we want to just get across is that we just need rock to be melted to have rock and ice mixing at the pressures that we investigated. Okay, cool. Rock and ice mix. Um, are the temperatures even relevant to that rock ice barrier within water worlds? Let's take a step back and think about the growth of a planetary system. Um, so planets, kind of what we learn in some um, astronomy or astrophysics courses is that we start off with this clump of gas. There's some inertia. Things start you know, flattening out. Um, we start slowly maybe, depending on what type of model you consider, things start accreting and planets start growing. Um, and then we ultimately end up with something that is a little uh, more familiar, like our own solar system. Um, it's a very active area of research, so I won't make any conclusions. All that I'm saying are just kind of maybe what I believe or um, what I like to understand, what makes more sense to me. So yes, this is also a very active area of research of how planets grow, but I just wanted to kind of put us in the right perspective for, our, for my work. Um, so now let's look at this area of our planet growth uh, figure. So many researchers believe that planets grow through this collisional growth model. So this means that you have planetesimals, so pretty much mini planets, and they're hitting each other and ultimately forming these larger planets. Um, these collisions are highly energetic and they're a perfect source of uh, temperature, of increased temperature within these planet interiors. So I like to think that collisional growth is a form of planetary growth. Um, so for our impact simulations, um, we're going to assume that our water world grew this way. Therefore, we collaborated with Sarah Stewart at UC Davis. Now I'm gonna, she did all these simulations, so I'm gonna do my best to describe kind of very roughly how these were done. Um, again, uh, I would just implore you to maybe check out our website or look up these um, SPH simulations to learn a little bit more, but I'm not the expert to ask about these things in particular. Um, but we collaborated with Sarah Stewart. Um, she performed these giant impact simulations using smoothed particle hydrodynamics. And we she mimicked um, two water rich planetesimals hitting each other. And then for the purposes of this talk, I'll just discuss one of these impacts. Um, so to the right here, I show an initial configuration of one giant water-rich planetesimal, um, and then one smaller one with a little bit less water, but it would still be considered a massive water layer, where we have iron, an iron core, a rocky mantle, and then this huge water layer overlaid. Um, so in these smooth particle hydrodynamic simulations, um, the planetesimals or these small planets are described by like a bunch of really densely packed uh, points. 
And um, you'll see what I mean shortly, because I'm going to show you the trajectory of a giant impact simulation. Um, but in this simulation alone, there are like 500,000 points. So that's like a lot of heavy computation. And each point you can think of as like a clump of material. So there are going to be like, you know, certain number of points that are associated with the iron. And what, it's going to think of it as like an iron clump and then so on and so forth for the rock and for the water. Um, so uh, once the trajectory is completed, we can get thermodynamic information of the material out from these um, simulations. So we'll be able to get pressures and temperatures and see whether mixing might occur in these planets. So again, from these simulations, we're gonna determine whether pressures and temperatures for mixing were met and then determine the amount of superheated silicate that was mixed up into the water layer. And then I put an asterisk here because this is a conservative estimate Again, there's a lot of really exciting research, even in the SPH simulation side of things. Um, so there's a lot of work being done. And we say conservative estimate because that's some of the work that some of the thermodynamic uh, information in these uh, SPH simulations can still be worked out and improved. OK, so let me describe to you before I show you the trajectory. Let's see what we're looking at. So we have uh, one planetesimal, so that's labeled one here. It is about 4.7 times the mass of Earth, and it's moving at 1.5 kilometers per second. So just, I don't know, imagine some planet moving around, uh, the it's forming uh, around its host star. And then we have our second planetesimal that is 70% times the mass of the Earth, and it's moving at 23 kilometers per second. So this guy's going to be moving real fast, and it's going to impact um, this larger uh, planetesimal. And it's going to have a, we're going to look at a graze and merge event. So the planet's going to hit, and then all the material is going to form together into a larger planet than we started with. So these are super cool to watch. So if you can kind of see, you can kind of see like there are like kind of points in that simulation. So those are all the 500,000 points. And then now we've kind of formed a new larger planet. Uh, so Sarah didn't only just run one simulation. There were a lot of simulations that she performed. And to summarize our findings from those uh, impact simulations was that there's we have now theoretical evidence that many water-rich exoplanets have mixed mantles. Um, and even though these are a conservative estimate, we showed that um, pretty much by conservative estimate, what I mean is that it's the lower bounds. So we there might as well can be much more rocky material mixed up into the water. But for now, for the simulations we ran, we saw that ubiquitously around 6 to 20% of the rocky material on these colliding planets do mix up into um, the water ice layer. So Ultimately, some broader impacts, and to summarize, it's crucial to investigate the interiors of exoplanets um, because as we find more of them, we've been really challenged to deepen our understanding of planetary interiors because um, they're the kind of the key to unlocking the formation and evolution of um, planets. And then even though we don't really have super Earths or sub-Neptunes in our solar system, understanding the interior of these types of planets um, will just help us better understand like why we're here, how our solar system formed and evolved. Um, and yeah, so our updated view of maybe some of the water worlds that we're finding out in uh, the galaxy um, might include this mixed mantle. Um, so to re-summarize our findings in this work, um, we found that once rock melts, rock and ice, wa rock and water ice become miscible. And then we provided theoretical evidence that many water-rich exoplanets have um, mixed mantles and that we should consider these mixed regions when maybe studying these types of uh, water-rich planets. Now, if DFTMD isn't like your thing, um, doesn't sound interesting, I haven't convinced you it's like the coolest thing in the world, uh, there are a lot of other opportunities to get involved if you're interested in the rock ice mixing portion of it. So. Um, there's a lot of experimental and theory work being done on rock ice mixtures um, with kind of like um, if you've taken some geology courses, um, some of our tectonics like they subduct, they might subduct water or not might, I think there's probably evidence that water is subducted down into um, the mantle of earth. So um, how that water like transforms and where it goes is still 
very actively researched um, in the field. Um, there's theory work that's done on like if you're interested in um, how maybe these mixed uh, layers might affect the radius of planets. There's you know really recent work that has been done, so that means there's still a lot more to do. And then there's also other experimental work for rock ice mixing. And this paper came out in 2021, and it was like it's one of the only papers I've seen so far on like rock ice mixing at extreme conditions. So again, very like a very fruitful area to be involved in with research. Um, so I just want to thank everyone um, for coming. I want to thank thank everyone in the Burkhards group for helping me complete this project in the time that I did. Our collaborator Sarah Stewart, um, and then a lot of other colleagues around Berkeley that like helped with really fruitful discussions and asked really good questions while we went through publishing the paper. I uh, want to thank the funding agencies. And then, of course, if you want to get a hold of me, you know, holler. I think I might be one of the few Tanjas. My name's Tanya, but if you spell my name Tanja, I might be one of the few that pop up in email. So you can just email me and uh, ask any questions if you have any. So thank you. Thank you so much, Tanya. Really great talk. Um... Let's start out with the audience. Do you have any questions? And Zoom folks, if you have questions, you can, yeah. again, please type them in the chat. At you. Um, so the question was pretty much what does this mixed rock ice mean? Like, what is the crystallography of it? How does it demix? Like, what's going on? So that's kind of also, thanks for reminding me to repeat the question, um, somewhere I'd also like to move into. So we've determined where, like, for a certain pressure range, what temperatures are needed for rock and ice to mix. Now, that's where we go back here and we can calculate material properties and transport properties. So that'll give us a little bit more information about how the mixtures evolve. Right now, all I can tell you is that they like fully mix. How they differentiate, if they differentiate or like how it happens, that's will take a lot more calculations and a lot uh, more like rigorous work to determine that. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. And it'll, it would, and how long that takes, we don't know. The computer simulations are also limited with like how long we can simulate. So we simulate things on picosecond scales, which is like 10 to the negative 12 seconds. And I can get four picoseconds and that takes me like weeks to get that. So like, yeah, it's kind of, we're a little limited. So um, future work, so look out for that. Or if you're interested, you can also do the work. <laughs> yeah, Mercedes. Not only do you see like they over time and like the water a little bit like the only thing that can cause these mixed uh, layers to uh, be present. So yeah, if a water world is large enough um, and the water layer is big enough, we can access those pressures and temperatures without these giant impacts. And we could potentially see, um, you know, maybe just dis these distinct, or not see, but like theoretically interpret that these planets would have mixed uh, rock ice regions. So yeah, that's very true. Yes. Uh, how do you Luckily for me, I looked at the ones without atmospheres. <laughs> so that's that's a little bit of an assumption that we made because when you start throwing on a hydrogen helium atmosphere, things could get a little more, um, the problem gets more complicated. Um, so 
yeah, I specifically looked at the ones without hydrogen helium envelopes, but again, it would be really cool to know that. Um, we just, we start kind of from a more simplistic view and kind of work in the details as we move along. Is there any like uh, like a uh, atmosphere when it's getting hot that causes like uh sure um well i'm not i'd have to think about that for a little because i'd have to get some like intuition i'd have to like kind of form a picture in my head because there's so many like types of exoplanets like i can argue one thing and then you know we can see something else and like it should like you know like hot jupiters exist like that kind of like blew a lot of like astrophysicists minds like how do you have these like you know big puffy planets so close to their host stars like there's like a lot of things that we maybe thought we understood that like it's getting a little we need to like um again understand these material properties at much more extreme uh conditions to like understand you know what is happening how these planets evolve and things such like that but um i can give you a lot of answers but i think they'd be a little naive if i answered that question specifically <laughs> And I could be wrong. There's like an 80% chance I would probably be wrong. <laughs> yes, but I don't have the numbers on me right now. Rock. Oh, oh, yes, yes, we did. Um, it's I'll show you my supplemental uh, materials. I have a graph of how the densities change. Um, uh, I think they're both actually the, uh, they're both similar, like within a couple percent of each other. Yeah, so I think like, so in actually, so, so yes, yes. Uh, which is the mixed, is the rock ice mixture denser than just rock and ice separate? So in this paper, they actually, so um, Caroline and Tim um, assumed like an additive volume law of rock and ice. It's pretty good. It's a pretty good assumption for the pressures and um, they were thinking of. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, whenever, uh, what do you mean from like mixed to unmixed? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, the kinks kind of our phase changes. Yeah. So down here, we're not claiming like what we're seeing is the truth, but it's just what we were able to um, like calculate and like identify. So um, this is a little bit more of a rough picture under here mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah yeah and then based on the um yeah from our msds and rdfs they look solid it could be just we didn't run it for a long enough time to get like a state of equilibrium um so again i by jumping in 500 degree increments, that was already like a pretty rough, um, like estimation of like where this melting is occurring. So this line, I'm sure will be updated over time. Um, this is just kind of like our first swath of like, okay, we need rock to be melted. Those are pretty low conditions. If they get improved, that'd be cool. Cause then that's, if, if it does happen lower then yay, mixed layers probably do exist in the water worlds um, more readily than what I'm saying here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I just for because the talk is geared more for undergraduates, I didn't show it here. I have them in my paper. If anyone wants me to talk about it, I'm more than happy to show some MSD plots and RDFs. But only if you twist my arm. I have them here if you'd like to see them. Would you like to? No. <laughs> yeah. Oh, um, not that I thought of off the top of my head. 
Oh yes, yeah, sorry, sorry. Are there? I'm so bad at that. Sorry, thank you. Are there any earth materials, two earth materials that I'm interested in doing like the same thing, like calculating mixing of? Um, not that I thought of, because I know there's been iron and like rock mixing. I guess there was only like iron and MgO, so maybe iron and MgSiO3. But I don't know if like the pressures and temperatures are high enough. I mean, the temperatures at least. I don't know if they're high enough for um, like current earth. Um, but probably as we fill in like our, the, the details of like evolution, like these mixtures could play like a pretty important picture to the evolution of planets. <laughs> right, right, right. With the whole like the, what is it? The D layer or something. Yeah, and again, what I said, well, like, it's just like what I'm maybe like thinking off the top of my head. So like, I, I could, I could be saying like, yeah, yeah. If only we could be like that one movie and send something like to the middle of Earth and just like sample it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> I have a question. Yeah. Um, so uh, it's probably a very naive question, but uh, I know the talk was you know, all the world, but is it do all types of exoplanets exhibit, uh, or like are there are there known examples in each for each type of exoplanet where there are mixed layers, or are there like some types of exoplanets you just like can't have mixed layers? Oh sure. So the question was, um, do all planet or a lot do exoplanets exhibit mixing? Are there limitations? Are there some planets where like mixing might not happen and some where mixing might happen? Yeah. Sure. Do all categories like exhibit some type of mixing layer in like certain cases? Yeah, so uh, I went to, I, am I still sharing my screen? Yes, yeah. okay. So um, I went back to the uh, planet types and the question is, um, do any of these types of planets like what they exhibit mixing? We don't know. So like the, even in Jupiter, that's why I'm like all these question marks. We don't even know if Jupiter has a core, if it's a dilute core, if it's a mixed core, like we, um, uh, the again with earth, if, if even on earth, if things might be iron and rock might be mixing. So we don't even know in our own solar system. So we are like really naive to other planets. For some of these, like uh, Mercedes mentioned, there could be like some size limits. So like, you know, if if there if we didn't don't, don't think that collisional growth is a good model, um, then maybe a certain size planet. There's just the temperatures are too low or the pressures are too low for mixing to occur. So like we're really naive. It's just very theoretical. Yeah. So good question because like yeah we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions from live audience or Zoom? Yes. In the thinking from the other prison simulations, there are only three options, right? So it's either the mixing or the option. Yeah. So okay, this is again, this will be um what I Sarah's really smart. So like what I can understand from what she's tried to convey to me. Um, so each of these points are a different material. And um, in these SPH simulations, that kinetic energy can't be transferred between material. So the rocky material can heat up, like the rocky material has an equation of state that describes it. And the water has an equation of state that describes it. So the water knows when it goes from like ice to liquid and the rock knows when it melts. But like now, if there are rock and water that are these two points that are next to each other that are like hot enough and the pressure is high enough for mixing, you, you can't interpret. Like there's no way to transfer temperature. So if it like, um, there's like some figures, I didn't show this plot because it's like a little complicated to explain. Um, but we see that um, if we pl plot all of those points in pressure temperature space, see how there are these huge jumps in the material uh, temperature? It's because it can't exchange that temperature between material. So we have to like interpret. That's why I put those asterisks of like, it's a conservative estimate. Um, because if the energy could be exchanged between the two materials, um, that this water material would be much hotter. The rocky material would might be a little lower in temperature, 
Um, so again, this is like the lower bounds of how much mixed material there is. We also have a video where we tried to um, kind of mimic a mix. Like we try to tag the particles that would be mixed as brown, but it's really not scientific. So it was just more of like a fun thought experiment for us. Yeah. One question? If not, let's thank our speaker one more time. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you, everyone, again, for coming. Really great turnout. Uh, love to see it. Love to see the EPS talk here, too. So thanks for coming. Yeah, of course. Uh, come speak. Uh, for those who came in later or didn't uh, 